Excellent, Dr. Bredesen. Thank you for that. And up next, we have Rita. Rita, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Welcome back, Rita. Thank you very much, Dr. Bredesen. My friend, Arti Batavia, okay. introduced your work to dietitians community. And yeah. my question to you is that, which probiotic to take in what strength to use and how long to use? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and we get questions all the time. And again, I'm agnostic about whatever helps people. So, I mean, the, as far as probiotics, um, I myself tend to like to use Garden of Life, which is, which is uh, David Perlmutter's uh, group. And I think David's done a great job, but there are others, some like VSL3, um, I'm sure, you know, RT would probably give you a, a better result, a better answer on this than I would. I'm interested in, it depends again on, you know, there, there's a lot of work recently on uh, uh, Ackermansia mucinophila and its potential importance in preventing neurodegeneration. So things are changing. Uh, as uh, Dr. Knight, who's done so much work on the microbiome has said, there's a lot that we don't yet know about what's optimal for each person. We do know, on the other hand, that there are certain microbiome alterations that are associated with, uh, with likelihood for Alzheimer's increasing, and that there are some that seem to be associated with decreasing. And they can even take transgenic mice and increase or decrease their likelihood by changing their microbiome. So there's no question that it plays a role. I'm, I, to be honest, I'm much more concerned about leaky gut than, than the, the specific probiotic because leaky gut is so incredibly common. It's doing the very things that we worry about with cognitive decline. It's giving you that increase in inflammation. It's exposing you to fragments and even whole bacteria that are giving you increased risk. So I'm much more concerned about healing the gut than I am about which probiotic you choose to take. And I have to say, if you choose the best one, it'll actually be food. So, you know, things like uh, fermented foods of various sorts. Um, my wife, who's an integrative physician, um, likes to use uh, fermented beets, uh, but whether you like, you know, other fermented foods, uh, kimchi, sauerkraut, whatever you happen to like, fermented foods would probably be the number one ahead of, you know, anything you can do with food instead of a pill, you're usually in better shape doing it that way. Thank you, Dr. Bredesen. And uh, I just want to say to our entire audience, thank you for keeping your questions direct and brief. That's perfect. We have a lot of questions to get to here. Uh, we're going to get to them as many as we possibly can, but you keeping them short and brief gives as many people an opportunity to ask those questions. So thank you to everybody. That's great. And up next, we have Diane. Diane, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. My father died at age 89 from Alzheimer's. What is my hereditary risk? What was his APOE status and what, what's your APOE status? I'm sorry, what? Yeah, so the, the hereditary risk ha has about 32 different genes associated with it. The most common one is APOE and APOE is typically two, three or four and you have two copies. So you can be a three, three or a two, three as I mentioned earlier. So it depends on whether your father was APOE4 positive or negative and whether you are. So you, it's very simple to find out your APOE status. You can do it through your doctor. You can do it through my APOE. You can do it through uh, 23andMe, anything you like, uh, but it's very helpful to find that out. There are other genes that are less common. Um, TREM2 is another one that increases risk, for example. Uh, and then there's a whole set of them that, that, that'll all contribute to this. But what you want to know first and foremost is whether you are APOE 2, 3, 3, 3, or 3, 4, or 4, 4. Um, those are the most common ones. And please, yeah, get absolutely, if you are uh, over 45, please get on prevention. Um, it's not going to hurt you in any way, and it's going to help you in many ways and reduce your risk. I can tell you much more about your risk if you find out what your APOE status is. As I mentioned earlier, no copies, about 9% through your lifetime, single copy, about 30%, two copies, oh, well over 50%. And there are other genes you can look at to adjust that, to find out whether you're closer to 90% or closer to 50%. And then of course, it depends a whole lot on your lifestyle and what this, in, in all the different things that you're doing and what you're exposed to. Simply living near polluted freeways, for example, increases your risk. Being in the California fires increases your risk. 
and there's a whole set of things. So you can actually get a pretty good risk profile today. We set up something called uh, pre-code, which does exactly that so that you can look at your risk profile and you can look at what are the things you can do to reduce your risk. Thank you so much, doctor. And up next, we have Michael. Michael, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself for Dr. Dale Bredesen. Hi, uh, Dr. Bredesen. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, so my question has to do with uh, homocysteine. And specifically, I guess, because MTHFR is such a common right. uh, mutation, I was wondering whether someone's heterozygous or a homozygous, um, if the digits, let's say they're, the, the level is devil, like almost at a hundred or in the hundreds, I'm wondering as far as vascular integrity, could that be restored uh, completely um, whenever it's discovered it's that high through, you know, methylcobalamin, methylfolate, trimethylglycine, any other things that should be considered if someone, uh, if people with these uh, mutations want to restore their the integrity or any any sort of damages that it causes um, in the brain, anything blood brain bar any, anything blood brain blood brain barrier permeability wise, uh, anything to to say along these lines? Yeah, great question, Michael. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, homocysteine has been associated with Alzheimer's disease risk. And there's some beautiful studies out of the UK that have shown that you literally, as you go above six, there is, you just keep going up and up in risk. And what they showed even more importantly is that after, if you bring it down, you can actually see this risk decline so that people, they followed them over time, then they decreased it back to normal and then they actually leveled this out. Beautiful studies. And so absolutely, you mentioned uh, this is very common. Now, as you know, the MTHFR mutations typically don't you know, wipe out your ability to, for the methylation. They will often lower it depending on what combination of mutations, whether it's a 1298 or you know, whatever you, you happen to have. Um, as it creeps up though, you're right, as it gets above 13 to 15, that's a concern. And you're talking about up you know, 100. This is definitely increasing your risk. And if so yes, you can start with the things like uh, you know, methylcobalamin and methylfolate and P5P, you can add things like trimethylglycine and you can go up pretty high levels on trimethylglycine. Some people take even you know, 1500 milligrams a couple times a day. And then you can reduce the, your intake, uh, you know, for uh, your intake for, for, for homocysteine, you can reduce your methionine intake. Um, and there's a whole set of foods that actually give you, and we've, we've listed that in the book as well. So you can look at, so there are a number of things you can do to reduce this homocysteine. Um, and then you're right, you know, uh, there can be vascular damage, but decreasing inflammation. And then you, you're probably aware of things like arteriosyl, which actually support the glycocalyx and help you to rebuild the artery glycocalyx itself. So I think there's more and more that can be done uh, uh, in the area of homocysteine. And then if there's vascular damage, please also make sure you're, you know, you're not just gonna reduce the, the homocysteine, not just gonna reduce the inflammation, but think about the energetic delivery. Some of these people may do better with better blood flow. Some people have suggested things like EWOT, exercise with oxygen therapy, or HBOT, the, you know, the uh, hyperbaric. So there are a number of ways to make sure that you're getting not only you know, vascular support, but you're getting the right substrates and including oxygen. Uh, to your mitochondria. 